Okay, Michael, are we on? We're ready to go? Okay, all right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to today's web call. I'm Betsy McKinney, and I'm the founder and CEO of It's Time Network. I'm calling in today actually from Denver, Colorado, where I'm participating in planning sessions for the Denver Gender Equity Summit we are in May. It's the first ever gathering of statewide mayors to discuss agendas for advancing gender equity in their cities. Today's call, of course, and thank you for joining it, is about safety and security for the Women's March on Washington and Sister City Marches. In a moment, we will introduce you uh, to organizers and experts who are joining us today. And on the call, we have over 375 people, and it's an honor to be with all of you key leaders and key influencers in your own field. And here are some stats that we know about the callers today. 78% of you are marching in DC. 18% of you will be marching in your local cities. Callers today are from 35 of our 50 states. Plus, I want to give a special welcome to sisters calling in from Canada, Afghanistan, the United Arab Emirates, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Antarctica. So uh, welcome to everyone. Before we begin, we want to tell you a bit about It's Time Network. We are a growing national network of individuals and organizations who are working collaboratively to accelerate gender equality. We all recognize there are so many of us who are working to advance women's rights uh, Michael, excuse me for just a second. Um, all working to advance women's rights, but they are often doing so in silos, which slows progress. In bringing together individuals and organizations at the city level and to work on specific projects, we at It's Time Network are committed to accelerating the advancement on behalf of women and girls so that people can work together collaboratively going forward. We facilitate this collaborative action through our Network City Program, which establishes diverse local advisory councils in each city to evaluate the status of women and girls across a set of key issue areas, and then creates collective impact projects with member organizations to address the most pressing needs for women and girls. We launched our first pilot city in San Francisco in 2016, we will be launching in Denver in spring this year at the Denver Gender Equity Summit, and we will continue to grow from there. To learn more about the Network City Program, please visit our website at itstimenetwork.org for more information and to connect with us. But now to this call today, more than ever, women are yearning to build our collective power and to grow our capacity to work together for change. The election in November changed the national landscape dramatically and accelerated our plans at It's Time Network for launching these weekly web calls to connect and mobilize women and allies all over the country. Last Wednesday, we hosted a call with the organizers of the Women's March on Washington to introduce them to women who can help provide financial support and to other key influencers in our network who could help spread accurate information about the march in DC and in the sister cities. The purpose of today's call is to further the conversation with March organizers who will provide up-to-date information so that we can support their efforts, share accurate information across all of our networks for all of you on the call and your networks, and for us to learn how we can help ensure that all the marches are a success. To that end, we want to encourage you to share key points that are made on this call and engage in a dialogue on Twitter using the hashtag calling all women and including our handle It's Time Network and the Women's March handle Women's March. We'll share this hashtag and handle as well as our websites in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen for your reference. So as you know, today we'll be sharing information about safety and security at the marches. Before we get started, we want to clarify that we are not spokespeople for the the organizers of the National March nor for any of the organizers of the city marches. We are providing suggestions and general tips about personal actions you can take regarding your own safety and security. 
it's not legal advice. And each person attending the march is responsible for marching safely and uh, finding your own uh, ways of um, being in the crowds in a, in a safe manner. The marches have been declared nonviolent, peaceful demonstrations. And it's up to everyone working together to create the safety for all of us. And at the end of this presentation and panel discussion, we will answer questions that you can submit by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So please submit your questions throughout the call as we're going along so that we can review them and prepare to respond at the end. So let's begin. First, we'll hear from the Women's March on America team, including Cece Hall, former director of volunteer engagement on Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign, and longtime advocate and activist for financial literacy. We'll also hear from Jillian Misrak, who has nearly 20 years of experience in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector, most recently at the William and Flora Hewitt Foundation, and currently with uh, Proper Daily, a social impact firm in LA, which is supporting Take the Oath, and you'll hear more about that in just a bit. So they will talk about the work that the Women's March on America team has done to ensure safety and security and sharing a safety checklist that they've created for March organizers, along with a citizen's oath that we can all take prior to the march. Before we start, we want to share quickly that the Women's March on America is the group that is organizing the sister marches happening all over the country. They are closely affiliated with the DC March, which is the Women's March on Washington. I'll let Cece and Jill uh, speak further about it. So Cece, um, if you'd like to begin, are you with us now? I am, can you hear me okay? I think so, go right ahead. Welcome. Thank and you. First of all, wait, thank you. I just want to say thank you so much for all the work you and your team are doing. You jumped in and started to provide organizing support for the very many 300 or more uh, sites now across the country and the world. And you all have stepped in to fill a um, organizing void. So thank you for all your work. Well, thank you, Betsy. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this call. And um, thank you to everyone who's joined this call. So um, as mentioned, myself and a small team are the Sister March support team. And I just wanna start off with, if you can go to the DC March, please do. But if you can't get to DC on the 21st, chances are there's a march near you. And so um, myself and the small team support all these amazing organizers around the world, in the US and globally, that are putting together a march in their city. And it's a tremendous undertaking. So. Um, for anyone on this call that is organizing a march in, in your city, um, I just want to give you a huge virtual hug for all that you're going through to make this happen because we know how hard it is and you're doing the heavy lifting. And because of that, so many people are going to be able to participate in this day. And so a couple things I just wanted to cover. As mentioned, there's over 250 marches uh, globally and more are getting added every day um, as people around the world want to participate in solidarity with this message of unity and women's rights, also equal rights for everyone. So um, if you're not sure where a march is near you, you can go to womensmarch.com slash sisters, or you can go to the main page, womensmarch.com, and there's a spot you can click that says find your local march. That's also where you can go to get information on how to get to DC. And there you can RSVP for the march. And that's when you're going to see a kind of an agreement when you um, uh, RSVP for a march. And what we're asking is, is a couple of basic things. One, uh, no violence. So uh, let me start off with, if you can't take it on an airplane, you can't take it to the march. So no chairs, no weapons, please no drugs and alcohol. Um, also, if you have signage, um, no sticks or selfie sticks. Um, a lot of people are using um, cardboard tubing like you would find um, for either wrapping paper or paper towels to hold up their signs. That's fine as well. Um, so you are agreeing to that because, again, the message of all of these marches and everyone uh, in solidarity is that this is a peaceful march and that we want to make sure it's inclusive. And so the other thing I would say is whether you've been fighting in your neighborhood, your community, your state, or in your country for equal rights for any group, 
um, long time, or if you're new to this movement, come, please come to Women's March. You don't have to be a woman either. Anybody can come because that's the point of this is that we're standing united for what we won't accept. We won't accept injustice or hateful rhetoric or anything that um, compromises quality, social quality for all. The other thing I would share is that um, if you're thinking about bringing signage, think about the messaging of what you're trying to portray. Because there's a story here. There's a story here, and we have the opportunity to mold how that story is going to be shared. So when you um, do bring signage or have slogans or chants or whatever it is that you're bringing to your, your march or bringing to DC, think of the words like unity, solidarity, freedom, justice. Um, those are the, that's the type of language you want to include in your signs or slogan. Um, I would also end with, um, you're going to probably receive an RSVP confirmation and bring people. So um, when you go to the marches, please grab your neighbor, grab your hairstylist, grab your brother, anybody, but bring them because this, this is going to be an epic and historic day uh, on the 21st. And I'm getting chills just talking about it. Um, so I'll, I'll end with that, but I'm sure there's more uh, to cover. So Betsy, is there anything that you wanted me to add? I just wanted to underscore that you said that for signs, no sticks. You know, a lot of people hold their signs with sticks. Um, you're recommending large paper towel holders or the large like Christmas wrapping tall, you know, cardboard uh, are alternatives that people can use for holding up their signs. You also said nothing that you can't take on an airport, right, or on an airplane. And um, the less you bring, the better. Dr. Chenoweth will talk about um, some personal safety items and things you want to have on your person. But but for right now, the less you bring, the better. Correct, Cece? Correct. Absolutely. And, okay, great. And, and again, just underscoring that the marches should – you know, it's primarily women and people supporting gender equality. These are peaceful events. No one is expecting violence or safe or security issues to happen. But um, these are some of the points that we have right now. Okay, great. Jillian, are you ready to um, share your part about take the oath? Let's do one more thing, if yeah. I may. Go ahead. Yeah. I forgot to mention. And I apologize, Jillian. Great to see you, by the way. Um, just one thought, too, is these organizers are thinking of everybody. So if there are mobility issues for folks that may or may be concerned about walking or marching, um, I know the organizers are you know, making sure that that's considered and that you have a, a more um, accessible route. Um, also safety, as you mentioned, I'm so glad you brought it up, Betsy. A lot of the organizers of these city marches are very concerned. They want to make sure that you have a good experience and that you're safe in this, in this peaceful march. So they are working with local law enforcement, city, um, having on hand folks to help out answer questions. Um, so I, I kind of took, took us off topic. Sorry, Betsy, but no you problem. made me think. And then I'll just, uh, I want to address a point that came up in one of the comments from uh, participants saying, hey, folks, we're all busy. Can you stay focused? Bullet points, not paragraphs. No need for bios of speakers. We're here, you know, for activator information. Uh, to, to your point, yes, we'll try. And also, um, there will be um, resources presented to you digitally at the end of this that we will give uh, in emails so that you can have those bullet points actually uh, visually as well. So if we try to present them now, it blocks the screen for all of us. So we're not able to do that at this moment um, and present it visually to you in bullet points. So Jillian, are you ready? What, would, what do you have to offer? I am. Um, and thanks everybody for, for this time. So I just briefly, um, I think uh, folks know I'm Jillian Misrock. I um, am the campaign director for Take the Oath. If you haven't heard yet, uh, we are a 501c3 organization that's mission is to uh, provide an action, a unifying event on January 20th for every citizen, American resident, activist, influencer, and people all over the world uh, to uphold, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, even if you're not uh, here living in the United States or a citizen of the United States. I think if, if you care about uh, decency and justice and uh, respect and all of the things I think that this march is, or all these marches are really about. Um, we hope that uh, this unifying event that we're offering in partnership with the marches um, is, is a 
appropriate for you. Um, so when Trump takes his oath of office on January 20th, we are hoping that we're a coalition, a coalition of civil rights and civil liberties organizations pledging to take our oath and to be engaged um, at your marches for years to come. And so um, we've been uh, partnering domestically with um, about 25 marches around the country on both coasts, as well as the middle of the country. We'd love to talk to you all about um, ways that we can incorporate Take the Oath. And really it's just the language, it's very short uh, language. I know that some folks in San Francisco, who I don't know if are on this call, are incorporating um, Take the Oath at their, at their rallies um, at the end um, as kind of a unifying closing event. So if you feel like this is something that um, would be useful as, as a peaceful kind of coming together moment, uh, either before, during, or after uh, your marches, we'd love to talk to you. Our Jillian, stay further forward near your microphone. People are having trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so, so our website is uh, wall is sorry take the oath us, and um, we've also uh, have partnerships with universities around the country to offer street teams of people who um, can either support support your marches and or also help with um, sort of t the taking of this oath. So again, our website is um, is taketheoath.us, and you can also find me if you're if you are on the um, some of the sister march or the Slack channels. I'm on there as well uh, to find out more information. We can also share more information about Take the Oath um, after this call. Great, thank you, thank you thank so you. much. And now I'd love to, I want to introduce Dr. Erica Chenoweth. Erica is a professor and associate dean for research at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver. Dr. Chenoweth is an internationally recognized authority on political violence and its alternatives. Foreign Policy Magazine ranked her among the top 100 global thinkers in 2013 for her efforts to promote the empirical study of civil resistance. And she's well, well regarded in her field. I wanna say welcome, Erica, and what can you offer the crowd today? Erica, are you with us? Um, <clears throat> thanks for ha having me. Um, I guess Michael has my slides. I have a couple of links uh, to project at the same time as I'm speaking about um, some resources that I'll reference. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to mention is um, I was asked to share a little bit about what the typical hazards are. Um, we can stay on this page while I just talk about the, the most likely thing that people are to find uncomfortable is, is weather, uh, the elements, getting thirsty and hungry, um, getting sore feet, and getting blisters. So that's the, the most likely threat to, to security or safety for people who are participating. Um, the second thing might be related to emotional discomfort caused by heckling. Um, the, the third uh, potential source of discomfort could be witnessing mild violence, um, either by police arrests, by counter protesters, um, or by provocateurs. Um, it's extremely unlikely that there's any type of mass violence that, that would take place. Um, and in fact, all of us are you know, uh, at more danger getting in our car on any day of the week than we are going out into a major public space like this. So it's, there is safety num in numbers and, um, and I don't, I mean, I haven't heard about any kind of threats on the march or anything along those lines that are being talked about um, very openly at least. So uh, I would say that security for a lot of protesters is as much a mindset uh, as it is an objective reality. And there are things that people can do that are sort of common sense things to prepare themselves. Um, the, the first is to establish a phone tree before they participate, um, especially one where they've kind of arranged care for their children, um, anybody that they're responsible for at home, pets, plants, um, anything that they want to make sure gets cared for in case they get you know, arrested and are spending a night in jail or something along those lines. Um, it's useful to think about having a buddy system um, where, um, I, you know, if people are going with a group, that's great. Um, if they are going alone, um, just meeting somebody uh, on site that can be a buddy, um, that can be really useful. They can keep an eye out for one another. 
um, establishing a meeting point is, is, is a pretty basic thing. When, when I go into the, the field to do research in a conflict area, um, my research assistants and I always know where we would meet if something happened um, and around what time. Um, you know, in pretty high risk situations, a lot of activists have found it useful to write who their contact is on their arm, just in case all of their possessions are taken. Um, I would say Say though that, like I said, the, the most important thing would be to dress for the weather <laughs> um, and to make sure that uh, people are wearing sturdy shoes, that they bring water and snacks, prescription meds for themselves, some band-aids for blisters, um, and of course leaving uh, weapons, drugs, and contraband behind. If, if people have uh, prescriptions they have to take during the day, um, it can be useful to keep them in the prescription bottle um, because of their controlled substances uh, and they get arrested and the police you know, uh, look at them and have a question, they can say they were prescribed. Um, so with the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so there are really three principles that, um, that a lot of activists have talked about over the years for what makes an effective action. Um, the first is that participants maintain nonviolent discipline. The second is that they try to attend a nonviolence training in advance. Um, and then the third is, is that there are people who are helping things stay nonviolent. And one term that's often used for these is, is unarmed peacekeepers uh, or marshals. So with the next uh, slide, uh, what I've done here is just laid out a couple of, of resources for folks um, uh, to think about. The first is, is, you know, there are a lot of sister marches. I guess uh, Cece mentioned there are 250 around the world. Um, a lot of these may have varying levels of experience, local experience involved. And so it'd be useful for people to just know exactly what constitutes nonviolent action and what doesn't. Um, for example, I think on the, the, the agreement site, it says that property destruction is, doesn't qualify as nonviolent action in this case. Um, that can be a controversial um, gray area for many activists. And so um, I think the key is to develop the consensus before the action takes place um, so that uh, you people aren't sort of hashing it out and arguing about it at the, at the march itself. Um, the second thing is that it can be really helpful to maintain a festive atmosphere. Um, so singing songs, um, using celebratory tones, keeping things positive, making it look like fun and like a party makes it less likely for uh, other kind of negative um, slogans and, and um, moods to, to come and interfere with that. And then of course, um, uh, most people would just recommend following a, a common sense approach to things that start to look weird. If you feel uneasy, just remove yourself from the, from the situation. Um, there's a couple of links there um, that I think are useful reads for people as background for about uh, nonviolent discipline. So the next slide talks about this issue of trainings. Um, there are probably nonviolence trainings going on all over the place right now. Um, a couple of places that <clears throat> I know of that routinely offer nonviolence trainings or <clears throat> try to collect information about where they are. Um, <clears throat> our campaign nonviolence, um, showing up for racial justice, training for change, all of these groups often have um, um, in-person trainings available or they can be requested from them. Um, in terms of uh, online resources, um, I haven't found a number of video trainings um, yet, but there are a couple um, pretty good uh, websites that describe kind of what people need to know before going into uh, any type of action. Uh, one of my favorites is actually ACT UP New York, which is um, an LGBTQ uh, anti-AIDS uh, activist group. They've got a great list of documents about um, sort of how to prepare oneself. Um, War Resisters International has a very um, hands-on handbook for nonviolent campaigns that's available online, and so does Canvas, which has its Canvasopedia, um, including several sections about fear and how to uh, deal with fear in the context of an action. So then uh, the next slide deals with this issue about um, um, unarmed peacekeepers um, and accompaniment. So the, the key things to know here is that um, you know, the, that uh, accompaniment can really help uh, with um, dealing with uh, mediating with the police prior to an action. Um, so if, if people don't feel like their local group has the um, experience communicating with police and mediating with police prior to the action, um, often these groups can provide some additional support or capacity for that. 
And then during the event, um, sometimes unarmed peacekeepers serve as arrest monitors. <laughs> you know, so if if uh, people are, start getting arrested, they record their names, um, where which precinct they're going to. They might record the the arrest, and then they might go to the precinct where the the people are being held to make sure that they're released in a timely manner. Um, the other thing they can do is they can manage provocateurs, whether the provocateurs are people from inside the movement that aren't maintaining nonviolent discipline. Um, and then uh, they can also be people that come in from the outside to deliberately provoke uh, the movement into violence. So um, I would say that uh, ways that, that marshals have been used in the past um, to maintain uh, nonviolent discipline have been, you know, anything from shouting down somebody that looks like they're about to attack police to actually forming human chains between the police and the provocateur to pointing out the, the person to the police and asking them to remove them uh, to, um, you know, basically surrounding the person and removing them um, and putting them in a taxi cab and having them drive away or something. So these are all very, um, um, there's a there's a widespread variation in the capacity of local movements to do any of these things and all of them can be a little bit tricky um, and controversial at times so, so i think the key here would be just to um to have you know local organizers um consulting with one another about what their past experience has been and what their plans are and then there's a number of different contacts um, that i think have a lot of experience with unarmed peacekeeping that i've provided here um, for people to reach out to. I know Veterans for Peace and a lot of their affiliate organizations plan to be there at, at the Washington March. They also have many local chapters. Those local chapters can be consulted for support as well. So um, just in closing, I'll go to the, the last slide here. There's a couple other resources. And I would just mention um, one other thing in terms of security um, is just to be mindful um, about uh, 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 photography um, and online video streaming and things from from cell phones. Um, part of the reason I bring this up is just because um, you know that when people um, take selfies or whatever or they're they're live streaming an, an event um, and then posting it on social media, um, it it can often show people who didn't give their consent to be recorded and put online. Um, and it basically identifies them as an in opposition. So I would just say one kind of general principle learned from a lot of different international contexts where activists are using digital technology is to um, encourage folks to make sure that uh, they have the consent of anybody that appears full-faced in their photos um, before they post them online. Um, so just to make sure that people know that they're self-identifying as somebody uh, who's involved in this protest. That's it. Okay, thank you, Erica. That's a lot and great information. And um, and I know uh, people are putting questions uh, into the chat box, so continue to do that. We're gonna chat for just a minute. Um, Jillian, can you just re recap just a little bit about, because people weren't able to hear you in the very beginning um, because of your mic, um, about the oath and do you have the oath or where is it posted so people can see what it's about? Yes, absolutely. I'm so sorry about that. So um, taketheoath.us is a 501c3 uh, based in the United States. We are, our mission is really to provide an activist and um, unifying opportunity for people at marches all over the world to take an oath as a citizen, as a as a global citizen, as an American, as a resident, as an activist, to um, to take an oath to uphold, protect, and defend, um, you know, justice, equality, equity, um, everything that I think that these marches stand for. And we're offering this as an opportunity. Um, if you'd like to partner with Take the Oath uh, at at your marches, um, please visit taketheoath.us or you can reach me on Slack to find more about it. I'm also going to be able to share a few slides after, uh, after this meeting, um, which, which details the, is sort of how to take the oath, what the oath is about. But essentially, um, we've got uh, marches all over the country incorporating take the oath in some of their speeches at their rallies. Um, using it, as I said, as a closing, uh, a closing event. And, and what we're really hoping is that this um, is, is a, a group, a coalition of 
civic engaged, civically engaged um, people all over, all over the world who are going to watch and hope and, um, and, and be engaged with, with Trump as he, uh, you know, leads the country and, um, and make sure that, that we are also engaged and informed and um, are, are doing our part as, as global citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much. So just to recap again, the, um, we know that the EC organizers and all of the sister city organizers are all proclaiming, you know, nonviolent Kingian participation. And that is the purpose of these marches. They are not, you know, protests like wild, you know, like uh, events and and we can think back to an example just recently of the uh, the climate march in the, in New York beautiful wonderful experience the marchers had an amazing time there was no violence that I had heard of and I was in the midst of it and and it was a wonderful demonstration of a unified set of uh, concepts, but diverse voices. There was lots of room for people to give different messages. And Cece, let's just talk about um, the, um, you know, just that the, the positivity right now around the marches is really what's first and foremost is happening. But this conversation is because the climate has changed or the, you know, the landscape has changed since that New York City climate march. And there is a greater sense that there might be you know, provocateurs, or there could be incited violence, even though none of us are going there for that purpose. So, so we felt it important to have this conversation, provide some of these bullet points that Erica had, and, but in general, it should be a very positive experience. Did you just want to say anything further, Cece? But, any further? Yes, um, I think, you know, the, the idea, at least in talking with the, the organizers of the city marches that I work with, they really want it to be so inclusive that regardless of age, gender, area of origin, whatever your story is, that you feel welcome. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that, um, you know, in, in looking at the positive message and what's trying to happen, you know, what they're doing, I think that's going to be the case overall. But I'm really glad that Dr. Chenoweth brought up, you know, there are provocateurs. That's and it could be just a heckler, it could be an organized action, whatever it is. You know, if you're standing together, literally marching in unity, and with that message of, of unity, um, I think that that's probably the best um, medicine to cure that issue. You know what I mean? So I, I feel like that safety in numbers comment that was made before um, is, is very helpful. And then not only that, but the organizers are looking at chants and slogans and songs and ways to keep people active while they're marching. And even at the end, some of them are having guest speakers, um, from all different areas of activism in this movement. And so it, it's going to be, it, from what I can tell, um, a very enriching and, and rewarding experience. And I'm hoping that because of these connections that are made on the day of the 21st, um, that folks will get connected to some of the great activist things that are going on already in their community. Because a lot of the marchers I feel like may just be getting involved. Some of them have been fighting for a while. Some of them are new to this. And so it's a great opportunity to make those connections so that on the 22nd, we're still fighting, we're still moving forward and we're still holding strong together. That, that's really our biggest hope for, but I would say on behalf of the organizers, I'm not one of them, but I, I would convey that. And I wanted to share anecdotally the um, information about organizers I know have been meeting with police the we have heard and we know from many sources not just from our contacts but from the very beginning the women's march on washington organizers have been actively engaged with the police there's a good relationship it is a positive and um a, Friendly, I think is even accurate to say. Um, we certainly heard the same is true in Boston. JB on a call with him the other day, he said that it's really, you know, a really fantastic experience working with the police and being sure that everyone understands what the limits are and how to um, respond to one another. And I know that that is true uh, from the uh, San Francisco Bay organizers that I've spoken to. And so can you speak broadly about the organizing calls you are having with the organizers of the sister marches? And is that true that they are, they're being proactive with the police in order to um, have goodwill? 
Yep, oh, you're on mute. There you go. Sorry. Okay. Every march is different. So there's, it's not a cookie cutter approach. Bigger marches are going to have bigger logistical issues. Um, traffic with law enforcement, making sure that everyone's in the know, their city, their permits, and so on. Smaller marches may not have the same concerns. That doesn't mean that they're not reaching out proactively and making sure they've kind of covered as many bases as possible. So I, I would say in a blanket statement, yes, organizers of the, of the city's uh, marches in all the cities globally are, this is on the top of their list of priority. Right. But I think you're going to see different flavors of how that looks, which I'm really excited to yeah. see all these different marches because, you know, you've got like Aspen, Colorado and San Jose, Costa Rica and, you know, every, everywhere, what that looks like. Um, from not just a safety perspective, but from the experience as well, because they're bringing their flavor of their city into these marches also. That's right. And so to go back to you, Erica, um, you know, the important point being that if you feel safe, um, it creates a safer environment. Um, the ways in which we can conduct ourselves encourages a lighter energy in the march rather than a heavier or fearful one. So being non-fearful is really important and also having your safety precautions, you know, writing known numbers on your arm, because if you don't have your cell phone or for some reason you need to know, you, you know, we don't remember our numbers anymore. And so, um, so it's about conducting ourselves safely and also what is our interaction Action with three different key areas, uh, three different key constituencies. How do we respond to provocateurs? And you talked about that. So it's important to go and find resources on nonviolent um, training so that you can think about it a little bit in advance and talk about it with your friends. What would you do if a provocateur is around you? Go find some of those resources and use the ones that Erica um, suggested. But the other is how, what is your interaction with the police? And then also what is your interaction with the press? And so, um, Erica, could you talk a little bit more about interaction with the police and also specifically what is your understanding? And again, this is not legal advice, but what are the, um, legal repercussions of videotaping something like what happened with the Eric Garner, um, incident and where you can be jailed for videoing. Can you talk a little bit more about police and videoing? And you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I actually don't know the legal implications um, on a national level because I think they vary quite a lot state mm -hmm. to state and, and town to town. Um, what I would just say is it, it would be useful for people to know what the status is, the legal status of um, kind of citizen journalism and um, at the same time I think um, I think the point I was more trying to make was about um, you know the the potential long-term political implications of, of filming yourself and filming other people and then posting it out on social media and and I think that's actually you know something to think about a little bit more than than whether the police um, like it that you're video recording or not. Um, I think I think in most places, um, you know, that one of the things I've heard about is that uh, if people do record an arrest or an incident um, involving police, that their um, their recording device can be taken away um, because it has evidence on it or something like that. Um, but or they could, you know, in some cases we've heard of people being arrested themselves for for recording these things, but. But I've heard of that less than this issue that's kind of coming around about um, people being actually identified as as political opponents or or protesters when they didn't want to be um, because of somebody's very well-meaning attempt to capture the moment. Um, okay. And I, yeah, I don't. I mean, dealing with the police, the, the key thing to remember is the police aren't monolithic. Um, you know, somebody who's standing uh, right in front of a protester might. Uh, be quite sympathetic to what's going on. Um, the person standing next to them might be really feeling quite aggressive <laughs> against them and it's just really varying. So um, the key is not to generalize from any single experience with the police and, and just ask the local organizers what they've done to prepare um, and, and see whether they have contacts in the police. Um, are they talking just to the chief of police or are they talking to the actual like shift commanders Right. Um, who are much more important actually to communicate with in a lot of ways um, because they're not political appointees or they they're the ones who are actually going to be making the calls on the ground okay. um, and so that that's that's what I would say okay great 
Nice. Well, let's um, let's go to questions. Carrie uh, Norton is on the line. Carrie, are you ready? You've been fielding questions. What do we have? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, everyone. So we've gotten a number of questions regarding logistics. And um, what we're asking you to do there is refer to the um, Women's March website, um, which Kate will feather, feature in the chat box. I think it's women's, womensmarch.com. Um, there are a number of FAQs there that you can take a look at, and the site is being updated very regularly with logistical information. So a number of those questions are regarding buses and um, March starting points and stage locations, et cetera. So um, again, if you could please refer to the March web, the primary March website for that information. Um, a couple of questions that um, I'll just throw out there for any of the panelists to answer, um, specifically uh, buttons. Are there gonna be an issue with buttons? Um, if people wear buttons or pass out buttons, are those sharp points an, a security issue that people should be concerned about? Good question. I've never heard so. Have you, Cece? No. Um, my, uh, this is not a, a official answer or anything like that. My inclination would be no. Um, that it should be fine to have buttons. But uh, something that maybe to connect with either on the winsmarch.com site, see if it's listed as a prohibited item, or with the organizer of the march in your city if you're going to a local one. Um, but just my thought is uh, I don't think that would be a concern. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, great. So the next question, um, I think we talked about sticks already. So I would imagine no sharp sticks, no sticks of any kind really are advised. And Betsy mentioned cardboard. So toilet paper rolls or wrapping paper rolls. There was a question about piping for signage. Um, if people wanted to carry a big sign, does anyone want to address a question about like piping, like PVC piping? Yeah, well, um, all of those are going to be questions that, you know, um, we're not able to give an authoritative answer to that. And I think um, the best thing is to try to contact your local Sister March organizer on the website at, um, you know, um, womensmarch.com. But PVC certainly is better. Certainly you can't use metal piping, you know you wouldn't but um i would imagine pvc is light enough that it's worth a chance you know to bring it and but i we can't say for sure okay here's an interesting question from um regarding um what are organizers doing and again we're probably not in a position to answer this but it's an interesting question what are organizers doing to offset resource drains to dc city services this is a common um impact of marches and activities like this um, and, you know, a suggestion is made or a, a, an offer to, you know, make donations to grassroots groups and or organizers to support the, the impact that the march might have on the local community. Um, I can say anecdotally, Carrie, that I have heard some talk about that and there's an awareness of it. And that's what I really want to give a shout out to the head organizers of the DC march. They are very sensitive and concerned about their impacts, how it disproportionately impacts, you know, different communities. They're very aware. And I think we could not be as a, uh, we couldn't be in better hands, you know, in terms of that awareness and sensitivity. So whoever asked that question, thank you. And um, without being able to give a specific, I know there's awareness about those things. And, it, and also there are cost issues that are built into, I think, the um, preparing for the march, even things like having to have bike racks available so that um, it doesn't disproportionately impact people's property where bikes get stored and whether it's the porta potties and how they're handled. That is one reason why if you can help donate to the march, do. $5 matters. If every person going to a march gave $5 on the website, those organizers would have a much better um, experience right now. And so contribute to the march to help. They are, these are a very savvy social and racial justice organizers that are going to use that money as better and as well as anyone you could ever imagine. So donate and help with those costs and they will be mitigating. Okay. And um, we have a question about um, whether backpacks are allowed. Um, 
I don't know if that anyone's in a position to answer that. Cece, have you all talked about that on the um, Sister March organizing call, backpacks? We haven't talked about it on the call yet. Um, our next call is actually more the day of logistics, like what we're covering now for um, BC March as well. Um, I do know that it's been mentioned to have uh, clear bags or see-through bags if possible. And I think you said it actually is travel light, as little as possible. Um, obviously have your ID on you and it was mentioned water and warm clothing, depending on where you are in the, in the world marching. Um, but it, it, backpack wise, um, I don't know if there's a specific like prohibition against it. I think the preference is transparency in general and um, leave the luggage at home. Great. So the last question regarding security specifically is, um, I haven't heard a mention of this, but is there any practical advice that any of our panelists can offer on preventive measures to counteract tear gas effects should such a thing happen? I did hear about um, on some research that I had done that to counteract tear gas or pepper spray was to bring um, mm, tissues or paper towels soaked in apple cider vinegar or vinegar that are in plastic bags. And uh, so that if you needed to, you would be able to dab your eyes and cover them and the apple cider vinegar, anecdotally I read, counteracts the pepper spray and or tear gas but i don't know that so you should research it and you know we're in a vulnerable position we can't provide you know specific uh, recommendations but we can point you to places to do research for yourself i'll just say quickly uh there's there's a lot of varied opinion about that um and the the easiest way to, to to prevent against it is to avoid it, um, you know, removing oneself from the situation and then um, kind of waiting it out. Um, it's, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of different online sites that you can go to um, developed by protesters around the world about mitigating the effects of tear gas. And those are experiential, largely not scientific. So there's some advice, but I also, I, I think preparing for it in a way and expecting it, um, in this type of action um, might bring people undue fear. Um, yeah, and I think we want to keep underscoring that being prepared is good, um, but also that this is not um, this is this is not civil unrest. This is a march. We are marchers, and um, you know. I've heard some people say they might be bringing clear goggles, you know, like welding goggles that they might have in case they needed to for some reason. Um, but I think the, the expectation is that there, there will not be that kind of activity going on. And, and I, you know, without being overly generalizing, but a large majority of women will be at this event. And I would imagine that I, I, we can assume that the, pro, the marchers are not what would be called violent protesters. Is that, do you think that's accurate to assume, uh, Erica, and that? Yeah, I would just say, that, you know, if, if, if people were expecting tear gas or something, really a gas mask is the only thing, <laughs> you know, that what the police are wearing is what is the only real protection, protection against them. But, but I, I, I wouldn't plan on it happening. And, and that, you know, so long as the event stays primarily, you know, it stays nonviolent and the police stay nonviolent, it's the escalation to that level of crowd control is extremely unlikely. Yeah, and let's just remember the um, climate march in New York City as a prime example. Others, Carrie, do you have more? Sure, um, uh, this is a fun one. And we got this last week too. Um, what is our position on the pink hats that people appear to be making for the marches? I have not heard of this myself, but <laughs> apparently others have. Does anyone have a comment to make about the pink hats? I don't know about them. Does Cece, do you know? I do, but um, I, don't, I don't think there's a, a formal position. I think from um, this action that we're doing, these marches, a lot of cool stuff has popped up. And in some cases, posters, artwork, hats, things like that. And um, so I don't think there's an a official, as far as I know, position on these hats that you're talking about. But I do know what you're talking about. And I think that's one of the several offshoots that have come from this. And just trying to keep the momentum going um, for the marches and ongoing after that. 
Okay. And I think this ties into, you know, what the next call will be about next week, next Thursday. It's notably, it's going to be on Thursday next week because of logistics uh, getting to DC next week. But um, so next Thursday, the call will be about messaging. And, um, and Cece and I had a good prep conversation about the the conversations going on at the organizing level and that is no one wants to try to tell women what the message is we support diversity of expression um, that um, everyone has a first amendment uh, first amendment right but there's a unified message that's coming out about liberty about freedom and protecting everyone's freedoms and that we are united in caring for each other caring for the planet and that there's enormously wonderful positive unifying messages that we'll be talking about next week and um and yet no one is afraid if there's going to be some diverse messages so what you know women are allowed to say what we want to say do you want to say more about that cc I, well, I'll just say that, um, you know, for everyone who's going to a march, whether it be in D.C. or in your city, if you could go with the approach of I'm I'm watching out for my neighbor, I'm, I'm it's not just me. I want to make sure that the person next to me also has a safe and good experience. I'll have that frame of mind. I think that would help in countering any concerns like provocateurs or other situations, including the basic safety. Somebody could stumble and trip, you know, reach down and pick them up. So if we have that frame of mind, I feel like messaging wise, that'll, that'll exude more than any slogan or um, saying. With that said, do think of, of the audience of, of who's at these marches. You're talking potentially little ones, elderly, um, folks that you know, may not be comfortable in various, for various reasons. So I would try to avoid profanity possible. Um, but again, as you mentioned, is a First Amendment right, but that's just a suggestion so that, um, you know, people feel more invite, more included and welcome that show up. And um, they're going to welcome you too. So you could trip or stumble and someone reaches down to help you. Um, that's that's kind of the, the thought of this whole uh, experience that we're going to be having on the 21st. Well, and that ties back to what um, Erica was saying is that um, in a positive experience where the message is, um, is, is prom promoting, you know, qualities that we can all unite around, it provides even more safety, you know, and that there's um, lots of opportunity for diversity of expression within that. And, um, and messaging is what will the, will be the topic of our call next week. So I think we're ready to wrap up unless Carrie, are there any burning questions there that you're seeing that we need to answer? Well, a number of logistical questions continue to arise. So again, I'll just direct people to the, um, the womensmarch.com website. Uh, we, um, there's questions about what information we'll be providing to this audience following the call today. So I don't know if we're in a position to provide slides per se, but we will provide as much information as we can and including a recording of this call for you to review if you joined late and or share with others if you're interested in sharing it to people who are interested in learning more about how to stay safe at the marches. Great. Yes, we'll be providing um, Dr. Erica Chenoweth's slides that she did here today on the call. Also, CC, um, what not to bring. There's a list of what not to bring to the event. And um, any other resources that we put together will be in an immediate follow-up email. So um, I think that's good. Jillian, did you have anything further to say to wrap up before we say goodbye? You good? I think I'm good. I, I just uh, sent you all um, the slide. So if you'd like to share um, more information about Take the Oath with folks on this call, um, I think you have those in an email and I'm happy to follow up with people offline. My email is Jillian at properdaily.com. Okay. And um... Well, with that, then I think we'll say goodbye to everyone and thank you. And Michael, just one direction, if you would, at the end when we close, um, if you'll pop up some of the um, URLs that people can go to and just leave them there as people leave the call and then they can refer to it in the recording as well on that and they can land on that slide. Um, and I want to thank everyone and we'll look forward to seeing you or talking to you next week. And um, be well, be safe, and enjoy the march no matter what, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.